data science. So this afternoon session will be on inverse problems and uncertainty quantification. Uh, there'll be two talks by two fantastic speakers, John Bardsley and Julian Chung. Before I introduce the speakers, I'll just point out that uh, we'll, the two, two, two talks will be followed by a 15 minute break. And between 2.45 and 3.45, we'll have working group formation for the inverse problems and uncertainty quantification working group. And then if people want to propose an additional working group, or if the discussion spills over, um, there's time for additional discussion later on. And I can comment a little bit more about that later. So with that, uh, it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce John Bartsley, who is a professor of mathematics at the University of Montana. Uh, his in research, research in interests are in risk problems and imaging, uncertainty quantification, more generally computational math and statistics. Um, so fun fact about John, he was among the first batch of SAMC postdocs. I think if, if the first, if, if not the first, one of the very first. Uh, so it's, it's, it's great to have him back here, even if it's virtually, and I promise that that will be the only virtual joke I'll make this afternoon. With that, uh, John, please uh, give your talk on uh, marginalization-based MCMC methods for hierarchical inverse problems. Take it away, Vanessa. Okay. <clears throat> well, it's nice to be asked to speak here. Yes, indeed, I was, I got my PhD in 2002 and it was a postdoc that I'm pretty sure the very first year SAMSI opened and I worked with Tom Banks, who I just discovered uh, from Arvind last week, passed away um, within the last year. So that was a bit of a blow because he, he had a big impact on me. Um, and uh, since I left SAMZ, I uh, have been working in inverse problems and I came back, I can't remember how many years ago, three or four or five maybe, Arvin could say, or I know Julianne was there as well, uh, and got involved in a working group. And this talk, I thought it would be suitable to talk about the stuff we did. It took several years to um, bring it to fruition, but uh, we did. And so this is, this is uh, the results from a SAMZ working group uh, from several years ago. Okay. Um, I should also say, let's see here. Oh, there we go. Just click on it. So here's the outline. Um, I'm going to talk about hierarchical modeling, basic hierarchical modeling for inverse problems and a, a pretty basic MCMC method. This is the first MCMC method I, I looked at for, for these problems. And I call it hierarchical Gibbs. Um, it, it's something that had been done by statisticians quite a long time ago. It has some uh, properties, convergence characteristics that are uh, not particularly good. So it, it I'll, talk, I'll show uh, some of those results so that you can see that. And then ways to overcome that that are based on what's called marginalization. And in, stat in Bayesian stats, or probably just stats in general, marginalization is just integrating out some subset of the variables. Uh, we'll talk about approximate marginal densities, and that's where the work with the working group uh, came, came in. And some ideas that Arvind and uh, Andrew had, uh, we, we applied to some MCMC techniques. And then I'll talk about uh, a few different ways we can use these approximations. One's called the one block algorithm, delayed acceptance and pseudo marginal MCMC. Okay. So I'll just point out, I, I, I do have this book here that I uh, published a couple of years ago and it, it deals with these marginalization techniques, hierarchical Gibbs, not the more advanced stuff that I'll get to later though. So my math setup is gonna be a linear system of equations. So Y are my measurements and X are my unknowns. And I have, a, in this talk anyway, the relationship between the unknowns and the measurements is linear. So I have a matrix A that's known and plus some additive Gaussian error. So that's the setup. The vector Y um, is assumed to be m, little, m, um, r, little m dimensional. X is uh, little n dimensional. Those M and N will pop up later. And the 
as I said, the, Gauss, the uh, measurement error term is normal with mean zero and covariance lambda inverse identity. Lambda will pop up again as well. It is the inverse of the variance. Okay. So what makes inverse problems unique for when you're thinking about statistical models is that the linear systems, or if you're doing a PDA, PDE, you might have nonlinear systems, come from physics. So I think that's really a distinguishing characteristic. Uh, in, a, in a statistics course, a linear model is often, it, it has nothing, it may have nothing to do with underlying physics. It's just, hey, I notice a linear trend in the measurements and I'm gonna fit a linear model. So in inverse problems, there's a physical model that you wanna maintain fidelity to. So let's, our, on the previous slide, our measurement vector y, m dimensional vector y is contain has m different elements. And let's think of these as a values of a function y at spatial, at spatial locations si. So I'm gonna assume just in this slide anyway, and in this talk that the relationship between values of y and values of x is linear through an integral equation. Okay, so this equation here uh, defines uh, the function y of s. And then typically to represent the integral, to do some numerical methods, we represent this continuous integral as a discrete sum. Okay, so here's where things go into the realm of linear systems. And also this is where fidelity to the physical model is important. If I want fidelity to the physical model, I need a fine mesh, fine numerical mesh. So I have small step sizes and hence large numbers of element, large numbers of unknowns here. So large number of elements in my vector X. Okay, and we can't just, so in statistics often, if you have an over-parameterized model, you might throw variables away, but it's not so easy to do that here because um, I have this fidelity I would like to keep with my physical model. So I have too many parameters to estimate given the measurements and uh, that defines an inverse problem. So this, <clears throat> now I go from a continuous setup here to a discrete linear system. Okay, and here are some standard examples. On the left, we have image deblurring. So in the upper left would be uh, perhaps a data set that's measured by a telescope. It's got some blur in it. Okay, these are synthetically generated. So on the bottom left, we have the true, true X that I use to generate the data. And on the right, computed tomography. So there we have the Shep Logan phantom, which maybe represents tissue density and a sinogram uh, above. So this would be what the measurements look like. Okay, somebody's weed eating outside my window. So apologies if you can hear that. If we just compute the least square solution, we get these terrible results. So those who've studied inverse problems have seen this hundreds of times, uh, but just a straight least squares problems problem gives this in the deep learning case. Note the amplitude is 10 to the eighth. So we have corruption by high frequency content. And also in the, in the uh, uh, CT example, you have corruption by high frequency content. The amplitude's not quite as big, but same problem. Okay, so this is dealt with using uh, in, in classical inverse problems, regularization. And in Bayesian statistics, you would define a prior. In both cases though, you're incorporating prior information. So even if, if you're putting a penalty on, you're saying, well, I'm penalizing certain solutions that I know uh, aren't anywhere near where my true solution is. Um, so in the classical regularization sense, you define a penalty and in the Bayesian or sense, you define a probability density. So the called the prior. So up here, P of X given Delta is the prior. And it is, um, it, you encode some information about the solution into that. Perhaps it's smoothness, 
perhaps it's simply that you know that the uh, that the norm of x shouldn't be too big. Okay, and Bayes' law allows you to take the likelihood function, which is defined by the measurement model, and multiply it by the prior and get something called the posterior. And that's what we work with in, in Bayesian um, inverse problems. Okay, so notice here we've got the, the likelihood is defined by that the first math slide and we had a Gaussian measurement error. So we, this, this defines the probability distribution for the measurements y. Now we have that lambda, that inverse variance there. Okay, and then if I assume a Gaussian prior, which I will in this case, I, uh, with a covariance matrix L, this is zero mean, and a scaling term delta, I end up with this uh, posterior density that you see there. All right. How do you define a prior? So there's a million ways to do this. We're, we're talking about two-dimensional images. So one, one way is a Gaussian Markov random field. And if uh, in my book, uh, I talk about at the very end of chapter four, uh, the following second order Gaussian Markov random field. So again, remember the XIs are unknown, but you make an assumption about, uh, you make an assumption about given some region of values of X, you make some probability assumption about that. So this, this says that the value of XIJ is going to be approximately close to the value of the, of the nearest neighbor uh, intensity values. So we make an assumption that this is Gaussian distributed. So this um, object here, this difference operator here. And if I assume independence, I can take a product of Gaussians, of single variable Gaussians and get a prior on the entire unknown. All right. And in this case, n is the number of pixels in the two dimensional image. So that's why we're taking a sum here uh, up to square root of n. So we think of this as an image that's square root of n by square root of n. Okay, so we can express this Gaussian out in, uh, in, in the following form, in the least squares form, and then write it out in this, in this form here, where now I see the covariance of my Gaussian is this L tilde plus gamma I. And it turns out if I scale this L tilde correctly and I take the infinite dimensional limit, this converges, this is a bit of a, um, I should, this is not a very careful statement, but basically this discretization here converges to the, uh, this, this operator right here. So we have the negative Laplacian plus gamma and then the quantity squared. So if gamma is zero, this is the biharmonic operator. And this, this is actually a discretization of uh, the, the matern class of, of priors, Whittle matern class of priors. Okay. And here's an example. So if I pick a value for gamma that's appropriate and I pick a value for delta that's appropriate and I know, let's say I have an estimate for my uh, measurement variance, I can get a nice reconstruction. Right. And this is the map estimator, which is just the maximizer of the posterior density, this guy. Okay, but Hierarchical models, we, we decide we want to actually estimate more than just the uh, unknown X. We also want to estimate the scaling parameters lambda and delta. And so we include that into our, uh, into our problem. Okay, so same setup. Now though, well, let me go back here. So the posterior now depends on lambda and delta as well. It's not, we don't, we're not conditioning on lambda and delta. We have this expression here. So these two are the same as before. And then we have to define uh, two additional priors. These are called hyper priors on the parameters lambda and delta. So we have a couple of additional pieces of information that you see here. These are called gamma hyper priors. And there's a reason to choose gamma hyper priors. In this case, it turns out they're conjugate uh, hyper priors, which I'll show you in a second. When we take conditional distributions, when we want to do Gibbs sampling, it, it turns out the conditionals will also be gamma distributed. And that makes um, Gibbs sampling straightforward. 
Okay, one thing is, you know, you can kind of take this, this, uh, there's an inf possibility for an infinite regression, turtles all the way down kind of idea where now, however, I've got two hyper priors and I've got unknown parameters that I have to define. At some point you have to stop and just say, well, I'm gonna define these parameters explicitly. And if you do that, you just need to make sure that you're not over specifying the problem. So you could make these hyper priors so informative that you're basically pinning down the values of lambda and delta, and you'd really like the, the uh, you know, you'd really like the data, you'd like to infer these from the data, not uh, from your own wishful thinking or whatever. Okay, so these parameter values for alpha and beta uh, in, in a lot of situations are, are pretty, uh, they don't overly influence the, the uh, inference. Okay, so now putting all this together, I get this posterior density, and it has these extra terms uh, here, and these extra terms here. I forgot to mention that if you look up the likelihood, I've added this lambda to the m over two, which comes from the uh, normalization constant, and also this delta to the n over two, which comes from the normalization constant of the Gaussian. And those are important now because I'm estimating lambda and delta. So that's where all these terms come from. And then I've got these terms here as well from the hyper prior. Okay, so here is where it's nice to use these conjugate hyper priors. So if I look at the conditional, so the conditional of lambda given x, delta, and y, if I just remove all the terms that don't involve lambda here from this, I get this expression. And this is also a gamma distribution. Same for delta. If I look at this conditional, gamma distribution. And it turns out the Gaussian prior, if I have a linear model with Gaussian measurement error, a Gaussian prior on X is also a conjugate prior. And I get for this conditional, I get a Gaussian as well. So these are all well-known distributions and I can sample from those using what's called Gibbs sampling. And I just wanted to show you quickly this little demo. This is by Chi Fang, and you could, uh, I guess everybody will get a copy of the slides and you can have a look at his, his suite that, um, so let me see here if I'm, I think I wanna share, somebody tell me if this isn't working out. So I'm gonna look at Gibbs sampling here and here's how it works. Can you see the screen there? Arvin, you can tell me if you can't yes, see it. Yes, can, yeah. Okay. So notice these little green arrows and they're the hypotenuse of a triangle, the black directions. You can think of as conditional distribution. So you're taking slices of this density along those black directions. And then in the Gibbs sampler, you assume, well, you know explicitly those conditional distributions so you can sample directly. I'm not sure what happened. Seems to, oh, there it goes. It's back in the screen. And, um, okay, so you, you, along these black directions, you know the conditional densities, you take a sample and then you take another sample and you end up with, uh, that's how it works. So these black directions are like slices, conditional slices. Okay, our, our setup's a little bit more complex. Okay, I should be back at my screen now. Let me know if I'm not. Um, but we do the same basic idea. So you can think of these as these slices. These are these samples in the direction of those black um, sides of the triangle in the, in the demo. Okay, we've got three different, we've got three different conditionals here, but we compute samples in the, each of these directions. Okay, so a sample from a gamma, sample from a gamma, sample from a normal. Okay, and it, it's a more complex problem, but the basic idea is the same as that demo with, that we showed. What makes this um, interesting is, gotta see if I can get the, is, well, one of the things is that for inverse problems, remember we have a large number of unknowns X. So solving this linear system can be uh, computationally demanding. So these two, the gamma sample 
steps are just scalar samples. There's a, a MATLAB has a GAM RND function and it's, it's lickety split to get these samples out. So this step here can be challenging. All right, and it amounts to, so sampling from a Gaussian, from a high dimensional Gaussian, you can write as a solution of a linear system. All right, so here's some uh, implementations of hierarchical Gibbs. So this is hierarchical Gibbs. And these are just some results that I did some work with a uh, former PhD student, Aaron Lutman, who, who works um, at Pacific Northwest National Lab. And we were doing some x-ray radiography. And this is, these are some results obtained from running that chain. This, is, this would be just for the x, the x vector. And you can see that you can get the data is in blue. The mean of the x samples is this thin black line you see, and then you've got dashed lines for the credibility bounds. All right. Here's another example from uh, early slides, the image deblurring. This, these are, this is the mean of the x samples. So you run a long chain and then compute the mean of the um, samples of the x vector. And then the variance of the x vector, not super interesting. Um, this is, you can see this is just, it basically gives you, um, actually this is a standard deviation, pixel wise standard deviation, I believe. So it gives you some sense of the variability in the, in the reconstruction. Not very tight bounds, but also a, a, pr the, a prior that wasn't particularly informative. These are histograms of the hyperparameters, delta and lambda. So you can see that delta is around three times 10 to the minus three, and lambda has a mean of around eight. Okay, and you can also get the regularization parameter by taking ratios of these samples. Okay, so again though, you have this problem of, for big, big problems, solving this linear system can be uh, prohibitive. So this, this is not the SAMSI working group work, but um, Andrew Brown and Arvind and Sarah, I think with a, in a previous SAMSI working group, uh, decided to use low rank approximations of the covariance of the posterior lambda A transpose A plus delta L to get um, efficient solutions of that, or efficient samples of that X vector. So the idea is basically um, you rewrite lambda A transpose A plus delta L. So you can multiply on the left by this L to the one half transpose and on the right by L to the one half transpose. Okay, so you basic algebra there. And then I believe this is, well, and then you approximate this term or if A is rank K, this is not even gonna be an approximation, it's exact. You can write this in terms of its eigenvalue decomposition. So you've, uh, reduce the, well, computational demands by doing this, although you do have to get that eigenvalue decomposition. Okay, and L to the one half here is, the, is like a Cholesky factor of L. So L is typically the discretization of an elliptic operator. So, you know, Cholesky factorization is often computationally feasible. And then you can invert uh, this, covariance efficiently using the sherman woodbury identity. All right, and here, here's the uh, expression for the inverse. It looks similar. Note that this is a lambda and here we have d sub k and now d sub k is, has this expression right here. Okay, so now we can efficiently, uh, efficiently invert and also if I need determinants, which we will later, um, it's, it, that's efficient. And now you can rewrite this step three in terms of these low rank approximations. All right. So now I wanna talk about convergence properties of hierarchical Gibbs. And this goes for if you're using the uh, low rank approach of Arvind and uh, Arvind's approach. And so, Convergence in, I came from optimization uh, originally in inverse problems and it took me a long time to kind of wrap my head around what convergence means in, in uh, stochastic algorithms. 
it's more about you want to fill in the entire uh, shape of the distribution. So it's not about finding the peak, it's about um, fully exploring the, the density. Now, if you look here, this, the number of parameters is n plus two, which if n's big, that's going to be a huge number. But there's this really nice property that uh, we, in our case, we know what this conditional distribution is on x, and we can write the posterior as the conditional on x times the marginal. This p of lambda delta given y is called the marginal. Now we can use that to say, well, if I can get, uh, if I can get independent samples of the marginal, then I immediately, and I take a sample of the conditional, I'm going to have an independent sample from the posterior. So I don't know if I'm you know, explaining this, you know, it might be a little more uh, in depth of a concept to go through quickly, but the idea is basically you can focus in on the lambda and delta parameters in the chain and ignore X. And if you have independent samples from lambda and delta, then um, you know you have an independent sample from the posterior. So that reduces the number of parameters you have to monitor when you're doing, when you're monitoring convergence uh, tremendously to just two, two parameters. Okay, so here's what's interesting about hierarchical Gibbs. As you look, as n tends to infinity, so remember n is the, uh, it's related to the numerical mesh, the, the bigger n is, the uh, tighter the numerical mesh is. And as you increase n, you get closer and closer to the continuous problem. And you see these decay, uh, so here's, this is the, Autocorrelation on the right. These are the chains, lambda and delta chains on the left. Autocorrelation on the right for lambda and delta. I believe it's delta in the top, lambda. No, it's lambda on the top, delta on the bottom. And as n increases, you can see that the correlation in the lambda chain basically goes to, it, it, it goes to independent samples of lambda, but the delta chain gets more and more correlated. And this paper uh, that I was involved in with Andrew Stewart showed that in the infinite dimensional limit, so as n tends to infinity, basically the, the autocorrelation goes to, the correlation goes to in infinity. So you never move off of the initial delta. Okay, so this is a problem. And um, a way to overcome it is to use marginalization. Okay, and the idea there is, so let's go back to our posterior is to integrate X out from the posterior and then just focus on the marginal density. So it turns out it's the, it's the uh, relationship between X and Delta that's the problem. And so if we integrate out X, we end up with a better, well, th there's still issues. There's no free lunches, but okay. So let's just look at the terms involving X in the posterior here. So that's what this expression is. And now I'm gonna expand this out and collect all my X terms. These are all the terms here that don't involve X, call that U of lambda delta. Then these are the terms involving X. And now this starts to look like the quadratic form within a Gaussian. Mu is the, uh, mu is given by this expression here. Okay. And now I can express the posterior in this form. So I've got P of lambda delta times e to the minus one half u lambda delta. And then e to the minus this quadratic form here. And this is just a Gaussian, an unnormalized Gaussian density on X. So now when I integrate X out, I'm just gonna get the normalization constant or one over the normalization constant of this Gaussian. Okay, so here's, now that's this slide. So I integrate out X. These terms don't involve X. Integrate the Gaussian. It's one over the normalization constant of the Gaussian. And now I have everything involving only lambda and delta. Okay, so U of lambda delta and then C of lambda delta is this log determinant. So let's summarize. So this is what the marginal density looks like. Got the hyperpriors. And then this exponential here with U of lambda delta given by this expression, I want you to note the inverse of the covariances there. And then C of lambda delta involves the log determinant. Okay, 
So I can sample from this using Metropolis Hastings. So I can have a uh, proposal distribution and sample using Metropolis Hastings. Um, let's see here. I was, I think I probably have some time and let, I think it's a 35 minute talk, right? So I'm, I'm getting down to the wire here. Um, so maybe I won't show that demo again, but you can look at the demo and what I use to get these results here is Adaptive Metropolis. And that's actually one of the algorithms in, in Chi Feng's, uh, you can choose Adaptive Metropolis and see how that works. But in any event, so we can use Metropolis Hastings to sample from this marginal density. It's just a two parameter density. So it's really easy to visualize. We just have two lambda, we have two parameters. These are the lambda and delta chains. And then this is the uh, pairwise plots. You can get a sense of the density there. The important thing though is the autocorrelation. This is for a high number of unknowns and the autocorrelation is relatively low. And it also doesn't depend on n. So I can increase n and the autocorrelations will stay about the same. So we overcome this problem that I mentioned before. Okay, I'll let you look at the Chi Fang um, demo again on, Metro on Adaptive Metropolis. Okay, so there's no free lunches though. The problem, this is a nasty function and it involves, U of lambda delta involves inverting the covariance, which we already decided was difficult. And then there's also a log determinant in there as well, which, which can be quite nasty. Okay. So um, a different algorithm. So let me just say here, so we, this is nice, but the problem with Metropolis Hastings is I have to evaluate this function, which requires inverting this matrix and, and, and computing this log determinant. So we wanna look at some alternatives. One is what's called the one block algorithm. And the idea there is in this step one, you compute a sample from the same proposal as I had up, proposal distribution as I had up in the Metropolis Hastings case. But then I add a step where I compute the condi a conditional sample on X given those proposed values. And now rather than looking at this uh, row one is this acceptance probability that uh, involves evaluating the marginal, I evaluate this acceptance probability, which, which involves the full posterior and the conditional. And then I don't actually have to evaluate the marginal density at all. Okay, still no free lunch because I have to, to get this Gaussian sample X star, I need to solve a linear system. So I still have to solve a linear system. The other interesting thing about this is that it gives exactly the same chain in Lambda and Delta. So I thought about putting this in the slide, but you can, it's really a simple exercise to write this out, the full posterior out as the conditional times the marginal and you get cancellations and you get exactly the same acceptance probability as in Metropolis Hastings case. So this is one block. Still have to invert this covariance. I can use, I can see I'm getting down to the wire here. Um, I can use this low rank idea that I showed before. And that gives me easy and efficient invert inversion of the covariance. And also the log determinant has an easy uh, formula as well. And I can define my, um, in the, and I can define U hat and C hat as you see there. Okay. If the rank of A is K, U hat is U, C hat is C, and I get exactly the same uh, marginal or, okay. But if I wanna do a low rank approximation of the covariance, then this gives me an approximate conditional P, P hat, which is in blue and a, an approximate marginal P hat. And now these can be evaluated more efficiently than the, than the, um, than the full marginal density. Uh, Arvind, how much time do I have? John, why don't you take a few more minutes if you need it? Okay, all right. 
Okay, so I can, from this, obtain a, a full posterior approximation p hat, which is this uh, conditional times a marginal. And then I can use that in my one block instead. So now instead of, if, instead of sampling from p, the conditional I sample from p hat, and it's easier for me to sample from this because I'm using these low rank ideas. And I just substitute that into my, uh, pro my uh, acceptance ratio. Okay, and if the rank of A is K, then P hat is gonna be equal to P. So this, we called this approximate one block. This is finally getting to our work. Another idea is, well, suppose P, suppose the full posterior is really expensive to evaluate. If that's the case, then you can do an, what's called an, a delayed acceptance where you apply the one block algorithm to P hat to the approximate full posterior. And then if you, if you accept that, if you accept a proposal using the one block, then you promote it as a potential proposal from the full posterior that's not approximate. So this would be a case where the full posterior is really expensive to evaluate and you wanna really limit the number of times you evaluate it. Okay, so there's that. I'm going through this a bit quickly. The only difference with this acceptance probability here is you have a P hat here. And then there's a second acceptance probability you have to evaluate. All right, the final thing we did was what's called the pseudo marginal algorithm. And the idea there is because this integral here, which gives the marginal density, uh, the marginal, if it's too expensive to evaluate, you can do, you can approximate it using importance sampling. So with importance density p hat, where p hat is the um, approximate conditional here. And then we do a Monte Carlo approximation of the integral. And we call this p upper k. And now the idea here is you just simply replace P, this would be go back to Metropolis Hastings, look at the marginal and replace the marginal where it appears there with this P upper K, which is the approximate, uh, the approximation obtained using important sampling. Okay, so there's a little bit more work to do here. You have to do this important sampling. Every MCMC iteration, you have to do this important sampling approximation, but other than that, it looks very similar to the Metropolis Hastings above. All right. The other thing to note is when K is one, this is one block. This is the one block algorithm. All right, so that's, uh, that, that's about it. These can be extended to nonlinear problems. And let me just conclude. So hierarchical models, they add complexity to UQ. And, but um, it also interesting research in, in development of new MCMC methods. We've looked at linear inverse problems and more recently nonlinear problems. Um, I can discuss that if, with anyone who's interested. And we looked at a, a number of different approaches that used low rank approximate matrices to improve efficiency. Uh, and combining numerical linear algebra with stochastic algorithms. Okay, I rushed a bit at the end there, but um, that's all I've got. And thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, John. Um, if there are any questions for John, uh, please raise your hand um, and I can, or type it in the chat window. There are two ways to do this. We have a couple of minutes for some questions. Uh, Baba, go ahead, please ask your question. Unmute yourself. Sure. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I have a question. I have two questions. One is uh, um, how much do you change the posterior when you do the low rank approximation? Um, well, I think that that has to, it depends on the problem. We looked at this for uh, de-blurring examples and it has to be, if I remember right, Arvind can speak up to this, but it has to be relatively, you can't, the, the, the approximation has to be relatively accurate. Um, it can't be a terrible approximation. It's, it, so it should be a problem that's amenable to a low rank approximation for this approach to work. So, so you haven't looked into actually quantifying the error in the posterior? 
I think Arvind, didn't you do some theory on this in these papers? We did, uh, but in the methods that John presented towards the end, we just used the approximation to guide the solution. What we are drawing, the solutions, the samples that we're drawing are from the true posterior distribution. But we're just using the approximation to get there faster, essentially. Okay. Yeah, so the, the approximation get, is like a, a proposal, used as a proposal. Exactly. Um, if if I have time to ask a very one more quick question, um, so so I um, so the the reduction in dimensionality was really dependent on how you factorize x, but if you have a model which you cannot factorize x, uh, do you have any suggestions what what can be done to do the marginalization? Um, well, I. Don't, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. You could use the stochastic, say, stochastic SVD. I'm not sure I'm answering the question properly. Um, you can use Krylov methods to try to. The factorization is really of the matrix A or this uh, prior preconditioned Hessian yes. matrix. So uh, there's a n different ways that you could try to do that. Um, and it, it, does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah, and I know for nonlinear problems, there's also these um, uh, dimension reduction techniques. So I'm not an expert in those, though. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We have a couple more questions, but in the interest of time, maybe I'll just let Joe ID, if you could unmute yourself and uh, ask your question, if it's a quick one. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Joe. Uh, thanks. Very pedagogical presentation. Um, Thank you. I thought there's lots of stuff in here. Uh, but my question was related to the approximations. And if, if you just have one, one lambda and one delta, it's a, it's a two-dimensional prob problem in that space. So I was thinking you could even drop MCMC entirely and just explore that space numerically since you can evaluate that function and then create some discrete approximation since it's just two variables. Yeah, you could do that. Um, that's an interesting... I mean, you still have to kind of know where the density, you know, when you run an MCMC, you have the burn-in stage, which gets you close to the peak of the distribution and you get a, and then it explores the distribution. It would be interesting to figure out how much, you know, you might save some work actually using MCMC. I, I don't know. Yeah, but, and in particular, yeah, you could just, there are more lambdas and more deltas. You you cannot do things numerically, uh, I guess, on a small dimension problem. But you're right. You could just evaluate the function at a mesh and yeah, plot. yeah, on a mesh or have some mesh refinement to to sort of capture the numerical shape and then yeah. use that. Yeah. Then you're done. True. But but yes. I see the benefits of 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 sampling here because you can have more lambdas and more deltas and other things. Yeah. In particular, if it's nonlinear. Well, and okay, the MCMC thanks. also finds the support too. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. You can start way off and still get to the right region. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Interesting. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I know there are two more questions, but uh, David and Eric. But if you don't mind, we'll move on to the next speaker. I should mention that uh, at the end of Julianne's talk, there will be some time. Um, if John is around, he can maybe answer questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll be John. around. You're, you're welcome. All right. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, that would be